I think what Indian schools need to do is realize that historically there's been so much importance given to left brain dominant skills that now is the time where we need to start focusing on right brain dominant skills. Because as we all know, with artificial intelligence, with machines, with technology and the way it is, uh, all the skills that we are learning or a lot of the skills that we are learning today are going to be replaced by machines. India is one of the youngest nations in the world. 54% of our population is less than 25 years old. And 65% of India's uh, workforce is going to be under 35 years old. And there's going to be about 12 million people coming into the workforce annually. Now that's a staggering amount of people and there's a lot of work that we need to do. So the purpose of today's panel is just to make uh, to cause greater awareness among parents, educators, and um, policy makers, and hopefully we can raise some interesting questions and then all work together to get some actionable solutions for our whole country. And it's already happening. So let me start off this panel by asking Navyata, who is an advisor to the Mount Litra School International. What do you think the skills of 2040 are going to look like, and what are you doing to in imbibe these changes in your classroom? Sure. So, Namita, I'll start by um, answering your first question. There was a survey done by the World Economic Forum uh, where they reached out to over 350 executives across nine industries uh, spanning over 15 of the world's largest economies. What they did was they asked these uh, executives that what their perception would be as employers of the skills that are needed to succeed um, in the future. What was really surprising was uh, that one of the skills that came up, which was creativity, uh, which was in the top three of the skills needed for the future, didn't even uh, was in the bottom 10 of, the sur of a similar survey done just a few years back. This goes to show us how much skills are evolving and at what pace. So we're not even talking 2040, I'm talking just the near future. And uh, to answer your next question on what this means to the Indian educational ecosystem. Of course, there were other skills like people management and collaboration and emotional intelligence. Uh, I think what Indian schools need to do is realize that historically there's been so much importance given to left brain dominant skills that now is the time where we need to start focusing on right brain dominant skills. Because as we all know, with artificial intelligence, with machines, with technology and the way it is, uh, all the skills that we are learning, or a lot of the skills that we are learning today, are going to be replaced by machines. So what schools need to do then, is to be able to inculcate in our children skills that cannot be replicated by machines. And those are things like creativity, innovation, collaboration, and softer people skills. Uh, so Avnita, I want to ask you some, uh, a similar question. You know, as a as the head of a global chain of schools across the country, the Podar Group, you know, you've already started infusing a lot of technology into your schools. Um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you faced and how you were able to scale this across all the schools that you have? Yeah, so uh, I think the Podar Group has been, always been a technology-driven uh, institution. Uh, but technology in our schools is not just a frill, not just for frill value. Uh, it, it's, it's a kind of a mindset, it's an attitude. And I think that's what, is, um, what we need to uh, keep in mind when we're embracing technology or when we're trying to bring technology into the classroom or into the schools. Because technology is not just about a, a fee package or a learning management system or an ERP solution. In a classroom, I think it's more to do with how does it help build uh, skills for 21st century, whether it's communication skills or collaboration skills. So, um, and, and I'd just like to share uh, uh, with everyone that technology was something that was feared by schools. I think uh, education is all about um, educators and what impact they can have on children. And if we want our children to imbibe those 21st century skills, if they have to be trained, I think our teachers need to be uh, trained. So they grew up in a different environment. So we need to... Um, uh, remember that these teachers also need to be handheld when technology is being embraced. 
And there are some myths about technology which, you know, uh, many schools had. And as adults, we had that technology, if it comes into the school, it might dehumanize education. And education has always been about this relationship between the teacher and the students. But I found that contrary to, you know, um, uh, breaking human relations, uh, the bond between the teacher and the taught became so strong because this was a situation where the students knew more than the teachers. And there was a role reversal that happened. Both you and uh, Navyata have touched on, you know, teacher training and teacher development. So that brings me to Fatima now. You know, you are the head, the, the MD of three international schools and an expert in teacher training. Can you speak a little bit about what you, whether you think today's teachers are equipped and how they're evolving to embrace some of these changes? Um, so truthfully, uh, I think we have uh, a fair amount of distance to go. Um, our teachers are uh, like you and I. We grew up in an environment that was knowledge-based. Uh, we carry a bit of that baggage as teachers in this era as well. That needs to change. Um, the skilling um, needs to be upgraded a bit quicker. Uh, we're all talking about it. We do that as educators in all these conferences. We talk about technology and we still debate whether it's good or bad. Uh, so we still are not uh, as progressive as we should be. It should be faster, um, because the world is growing faster. Um, exactly. She's just rattled off statistics that in the next 10 years, we'll be creating jobs that we don't know what the kids will be taking on. So I think that's a fact. Uh, but actually, to answer your question, Namita, are Indian schools, per se, as a country, um, coping with what the children will need to take on in the future? Uh, truthfully, the answer is uh, no. Okay. We're doing it as progressive schools um, in isolated patches in the country, and we have, you know, we have the pleasure of being in uh, many cities in the country. But we're not doing it, uh, uh, you know, in a way that's impactful enough. Um, we have to have more pace to it. But I call it the Bermuda dilemma. If your child came home with a 50 on 100 in English, what would be your first reaction? Oh God, didn't you study? It's a fact. We do that as parents as well. Because we don't celebrate ordinary. I think Mrs. Birla spoke about that. We want excellent. Uh, we want excellence. And we're not okay to celebrate or ordinary. Mm -hmm. So somewhere our mindset as parents needs to change as well. And I think this Bermuda dilemma, as I call it, needs to not be in isolation. I wish the academic boards would say, let's do away with the grading. Let's create a learning story. That has to happen nationwide for then the uh, management and uh, principals to say, yes, we can give away those class tests, we can give away the unit tests, and we can give away the annual exams. It can't happen in isolation. It has to happen as a okay. collaborative Thank effort. you so much, Fatima. So I'm going to now move to Sriram, who's the only male member of our panel, and uh, the, obviously the founder of Indian Raga. So Sriram has had the best of the East and the West. He's grown up in India and been to, I think, over 50 cities in India yep. and also lived in over 50 cities in the US. So my question to you, Sriram, is that what do you think is going to be the differentiator and what are students in India and over the world doing to level the playing field? Yeah, so just to expand more on that, after graduating from MIT, I lived uh, in 50 cities for a year, being hosted by 50 families for a week yeah. each. I was curious to understand what were they, you know, as parents looking, you know, to coach their kids in? What kind of skills? What was the role of the performing arts in their life and so on? And looking at all of them, I tried to think about when I was in school, what was that one course or those two courses that today are useful to me? And I couldn't come up with a single one. Uh, so which is what the kids today are going to deal with in 2040, which is why we're having this conversation. But I do remember that I would come back home and tell my mom that, hey, I got like, 100 on 100 in math or 99 on 100 in math. I mean, in a traditional South Indian family, you can't get less than that. <laughs> so, uh, and she would be like, oh, but have you made it to the debate team yet? And right from then, I think some of these parents and communities started seeing the value of extracurriculars, so much so that today, we're doing all of these classes that Mrs. Birla pointed out, like tons of these classes outside of school. Um, and that made me realize that the first time that I was ever on stage, the first time I ever worked in a team, the first time I understood empathy or worked with other perspectives was when I was in performing arts as a child. So that's what gave me all of those skills that today I find meaningfully successful in, to some degree. 
Uh, so which is what we try to do at Indian Raga. And which brings me to the point that I think that the skills that both in the United States and in India we're all talking about are creativity, teamwork, and communication through and through. And our curriculum today, um, in IB schools, I think there is the realization, but there are few of those and only very few can afford them. Across the rest of the country, that realization is still going to take some time. But more and more principals, schools are all reaching out to us to bring our program into their schools to supplement that. So I think to everyone's point, there is this whole thing of like financial lack of funding, financial limitations, and so on. But the model to go forward, in my opinion, would be to partner with those who can already bring in that capacity right now. If we have to train the millions of teachers and schools in this country to imbibe all of these skills, it's going to take till 2040 anyway. So I okay. think we should work with existing partners. There are many companies that are, you know, uh, teaching you jobs, uh, teaching you skills on the job, right, Sejal? And um, AT&T is a leader in this, right? They um, spend about $8,000 per employee to make sure that you skill up. And um, if you're not willing to do that, you can lose your job. So Sejal, as a management consultant focused on talent and organizational consulting, can you tell us a little bit about what companies are looking for in individuals and what organi organizations are doing to help build the right skill set? Um, thanks, Namita. And I think, uh, you know, you said that 54% of India um, is below the age of 25. But what we forget is that 46% is not below the age of 25. And so what we really need to also think about is how do we reskill a lot of the people that are already in the workforce? And this is actually a very important question that a lot of organizations are grappling with today. Um, I think... We talked a lot about this already, but digital automation, AI, uh, are, is definitely going to change the future of work, not just, not like in 2040, but much earlier. Um, and I think this is something that has been, because of, you know, social media and the access to information, actually been uh, made to be a very big thing. And it is, of course, because the rate of change has uh, more than increased 10 times over the last, you know, 25 years. So the first thing that I wanted to kind of talk about was um, organizations are really starting to think about how to leverage people very differently. They, what they're talking about is an open talent economy. What this means is they're talking about people that are going to be, um, you know, freelancers, um, temp workers. Uh, they're going to be a crowdsourced talent, you know, that's going to be part of it. There could be robots in the next 15 to 20 you know, years that could be part of your workforce. How do you kind of adapt yourself to work with this different you know, kind of workforce? So the one very big thing, and I think that's the second thing that organizations are realizing, right? That when you are seeing so much of technology uh, ch driving change, what will matter is the human skills. And the human skills are going to be what we already talked about, creativity, adaptability, judgment skills, being able to take all this data and to assimilate it in a way that everybody can understand. So that's the second you know, thing that I think organizations are really realizing. So they're reskilling people to leverage their strengths. So creating whole strength-based training programs is becoming very important in organizations. And I think the third thing that organizations are doing very, very well is starting to get people to understand the need to collaborate more. And it's becoming so important in organizations that it's becoming part of uh, the strategy of organizations to say, how do I enable collaboration more in organizations? Um, I worked with Accenture for nine years as a management consultant before I worked for two years with McKinsey. Um, and I can tell you that Mc Accenture's collaboration tools are absolutely unbelievable. For example, they have uh, a, an entire gamification-based collaboration uh, tool that enables everybody in the organization around the world, 300,000 people uh, to collaborate across the world very effectively using technology and just gamification. Wow. So thank you so much, Sejal. And thank you so much, panelists, for all your perspectives.